two things before Ron comes up. First of all, in remembrance of Veterans Day that was on Friday, I want to thank all the veterans that are here in our sanctuary and thank them for their service. Pastor Ron being one of them. The second thing is, I kind of feel that Pastor Ron might be doing false advertising this morning with his sermon title. <laughs> so let's have him come up and explain that. What's he trying to say, anyway? Uh, I want to recognize all the veterans, too. So would all the veterans please stand for me this morning? Please stand. Thank you, veterans. Thank you. Now for a little bragging. Yeah, okay. Uh, went to Lucas Stadium. Anybody know what Lucas Stadium? You ever seen Lucas Stadium? You know anything about the Colts? Where the Colts play? That's where we were last Sunday. Uh, they have it on a Sunday morning. Don't ask me why, but that's where, where we were at. Uh, it's quite a deal. It was. Uh, I think it starts out with 168 different bands across the state of Indiana. It ends up. They have the uh, eliminations and how that goes, and then they. At the semifinals, and they have the finals. The finals is at Lucas State, and that's where we went. Uh, our, my granddaughter, our granddaughter, uh, plays the uh, mellophone. Is that right? Mellophone. I didn't know anything about it. I don't even know what you know anything about music, as you've already realized. Uh, but this this is kind of kind of a, a neat, um, I don't know, different kind of sound. It's not brassy like a a trumpet would be, but it's it's just really mellow kind of thing. She was a part of that band. There's, I think there's 85 in the band and they, she had a special number. She was up on a podium and all the rest. And it was, you know, just old grandpa was just as proud as, proud as he could be. And it, she done a great job. Ended up, they were fourth in state. Now that, you know, at fourth in state, well, that, it, but that's, that's a big deal, folks. There's about three of those bands that you're not gonna beat because they come from schools and that's all they do. I mean, it's just really intense. They got. They got coaches for every aspect of that band. And I mean, it's a big deal. But uh, they are band too. Is, I mean, they have their own uh, in semis that pull stuff around. And I mean, it's, it's a huge deal. But anyway, for the state, the last time I'm gonna get it here, because that's the last band that she will be in. She's a senior. And so to go out as fourth the state as a senior was, you know, really something special for us. So I, I appreciate the fact that you were, you know, allowed me to go and be a part of that. It was a special time for Carol and I, it really was. And on top of that, yesterday I went to the Board of Ministry. Yes, you know all about that, right, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, I went for the Board of Ministry, as I always have to every year, and I got, we go, there's all the ministers were there, and I come away from there thanking God that I got you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I thank God every day for you, but especially when I came away from that. Some of those situations, that you think, my word, what's going on here? But it's not the church all together, tell me, I trust me. Anyhow, good to be here this morning, it really is. Uh, good news about hair. We'll try to get that cleared up, Tim, as we get along here. I want to thank Tim, too. Tim is just, he's always there for me. Whenever I need anything at all, and he's always there. And he, you know, uh, last week he had everything all ready, and uh, I had his sermon all set, cut down, so he had plenty of time, and then I guess he had a... Uh, a report from somebody and it extended it a little bit but um, other than that <laughs> and I hate I missed that too I really did. Uh, we're going to talk about it you know anyway Luke 21 5 through 19 when some were speaking about the temple how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifted delegate dedicated to God he said as for these things that you see, the day will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven and COVID-19. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't say that. <laughs> but it could have. Therefore, all this occurs. They will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. They will give you the opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But do not, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your soul. So, we're going to talk about hair this morning. That's a universal subject. All of us have hair. Well, at least most of us do. Some. A bald man once asked his barber, Why do you charge me full price for cutting my hair? There's so little of it. Actually, I don't charge you that much, said the barber, but I have to, have to tackle on a finder's fee. <laughs> little boy was looking through his family al album and asked his mother, Who's this guy on the beach with you with all the muscles and the curly hair? Mom said, well, that's your father. And who's the bald-headed man who lives with us now, he asked. <laughs> or you might like Dolly Parton's answer when someone asked her, how do you feel about bald men? Dolly said, I love bald men. Just because you lost your pose don't mean you ain't a peach. That <laughs> sounds like Dolly. Of course, men have the revenge with blonde jokes. You've heard them, I have too. I've even told a few now and then. Those jokes are absurd, of course. IQ and hair color have nothing, absolutely nothing, to, nothing together. But they're funny, and at least sometimes funny, and generally harmless. Here we go. A woman with, shall we say, light-colored hair was driving and got caught in a really bad hailstorm. Her car was covered with dents. The next day, she took it to a repair shop. The shop owner caught, saw the color of her hair, and he said, I had to have some fun with her. So he told her to go home and blow into the tailpipe really hard, and all the dents would just pop right out. <laughs> so she went home, got down on her hands and knees, and started blowing into the car's tailpipe. Nothing happened. So she blew a little harder. Still nothing happened. Her roommate, who had the same kind of hair, asked her, what are you doing? She told her how the repairman had instructed her to blow into the tailpipe in order to get all the dents to just pop out. Her roommate rolled her eyes and said, huh, duh, hello. You need to roll up the windows first. <laughs> I like that one. I'm sorry. Again, Dolly Parton, a famous blonde, comes to the rescue. When asked about blonde jokes, she replied, I'm not offended by all dumb blonde jokes because I know I'm not dumb and also know I'm not blonde. <laughs> I wonder what color she really is. It would be interesting to know it. Well, I've got good news for you today. Regardless of the color of your hair or even whether you have hair or not, thankfully, Jesus says you don't need to worry about your hair. Now, let's go to our story. Jesus and his disciples were finally arrived in Jerusalem. The disciples were admiring the beauty of the temple, one of the great wonders of the ancient world. It was a massive structure, a tremendous symbol of national pride. It is said, now listen to this, it is said that no sports structure in America today comes close in size and splendor to the temple at Jerusalem. Think of some of the structures we have for our football players and everything. Just think of that. This was much greater than any of that we have today. The smallest stones in the walls of the massive structure weigh two to three tons. Many of them weigh 50 tons or more. The temple was many, many times larger than any building disciples, of course, had ever seen before. And they were amazed that they would be. At this point, Jesus makes one of his few specific predictions of his entire ministry. He predicts that this magnificent temple would one day come falling down. He said, not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Of course, the temple did come down in 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus predicted it would. Titus, a Roman general with 80,000 men, set siege to Jerusalem. It was a difficult city to take, set on a hill and defended to the death. It was a, quite a deal. When the siege was successful finally and the city was taken, Titus ordered the whole city and the temple to be razed to the ground. 
Josephus, the historian, was actually there. He tells us that 97,000 residents of the city were taken captive and enslaved, and then more than a million died. All that remains of the temple now is a portion of the retaining wall called the Western Wall or the Waiting Wall. You've seen it on television, I'm sure, many times. The Waiting Wall, of course, is the most holy prayer spot for present-day Jews. Now remember, Jesus predicted that it would be come down, not a stone left upon the other. The, stone, the Waiting Wall is a retaining wall, not the wall itself. So his prediction was absolutely on target. Now those of his followers who were still alive in the temple fell, undoubtedly remembered that Jesus predicted it. But at the time, the disciples just simply couldn't believe it. That magnificent temple come down, unbelievable. Teacher, they asked, however, when will this happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? This is what he said. Watch out that you're not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Some of you may be thinking, he could be talking about our time. Actually, he could be talking about our time. We about talking about any time recorded history, as a matter of fact. There have always been wars and rumors of wars. There have always been earthquakes and famines and pestilence in various places. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Imagine that you were alive during the Middle Ages. If you've ever read anything about all that, the Black Death, properly called the bubonic plague, decimated one third of your population. 25,000 million people died in just under five years. 25 million. Between 1347 and 1352. Successive waves of Black Death followed in the next couple of centuries. People of the time interpreted this as the four horsemen of the apocalypse written in Revelation 6. This horseman was death who would kill one fourth of humanity by disease. Now, Jesus could have been talking about any area in history, he could have been talking about our time. Jesus said, Don't my people mislead you, though. The future has always been uncertain for every generation of humanity. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that things could get very tough. And they did. But he wanted them to realize they could get particularly tough just for them. Before all this, he said, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons and you'll be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. You'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends and they'll put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. Now, by this time, the, Bible, the disciples were probably regretting saying anything about the temple. Then Jesus does a complete reversal. And he speaks these comforting words to them, to us. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. That's the good news about hair, folks. Not a hair of your head will perish. Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling us the future is filled with uncertainty, of course. We can say amen to that. We certainly have our uncertainties. Will Social Security run out of money? Some say it already has. That may seem like a trivial concern compared to the persecution of the early Christian faith, thrown into lead in the pits and burned at the stake and crucified. But Social Security may not be the same class with those kinds of concerns, but that doesn't change the fact that the great many of seniors in our country depend on it. I can tell you this, I certainly hope it doesn't go away. What does the future hold? Will there be another major terrorist attack? It seems almost certain that there will be some, some kind. It would be unlikely that we could stop every single mad bomber or groups of mad bombers in the world forever. It seems very likely that eventually one will get through. And when will the stock market begin to rebound? Some of you saw your nest egg substantially cut in just a few days' time, not too long ago. Recession are just as much a part of capitalism as profit and loss. Some of you 
forget sometimes, especially if things are going well. But even if society is fairly stable for a while, how about on a personal level? What will the next doctor's report say? Does a tragic automobile accident lay waiting for someone you love? I don't mean to alarm you folks, but life is still unpredictable, just as it was in the New Testament times. The future is filled with uncertainty. One man tells us about a poster that used to hang in the office of a friend of his. This is what it said. Life is hard and then you die. Now, there's no reason to be that pessimistic, folks. Let's just say life is unpredictable. But there's another thing to be said. And that is, and most important of all, God is with us. In the good times and the bad, there is someone who never forgets us or nor forsakes us. So when Jesus warned his disciples that they would be persecuted, he made an interesting promise that I left out a few moments ago. This is what he said. It will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. This is the result in your being witnesses of them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you can defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom and that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. When he suggests that he need not prepare the offense in advance because he will give them the words he is saying very simply, very clearly, they will be with him. He will not abandon them. He's saying that as they stand before a court or a synagogue seeking to persecute them, he will stand there with them as an advocate. He will tell them what to say and support them in a time of need. Now the truth is that most of us will never go to court over the fact that we are Christians. But all of us will have adversaries of some kind in our lives. All of us will have dark nights of the soul sooner or later. All of us. We'll have fears and we'll have doubts. And life may very well turn against us at times. What Christ reminds us is that whatever kind of situation we find ourselves in, he is with us. What he's saying is that though life sometimes gets tough, ultimately not a hair on your head will perish. For we are in God's hand. He will not let us fall. We must never forget that, folks. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale once told of encountering a hurricane while on, on cruise in the Atlantic. After the captain managed to sail around the danger, he and Dr. Peale were visiting with one another. The captain said he always lived by a simple philosophy, namely, that if the sea is smooth, it will get rough. And if it's rough, it will get smooth. He had something worth remembering. But with a good ship, the captain said, you can always write it out. With a good ship, you can always write it out. Folks, we don't know what the future may bring. We really don't. We may be here another million years. Or on the other hand, today may be our last day on earth. Jesus tells us to trust God in the way. Don't worry about what tomorrow brings. At the same time, he says, prepare yourselves emotionally, mentally, spiritually, for whatever may come. May that be the time? It may not. It's certainly the time to take stock of our lives, to see if we're prepared for an unknowable future. Leave each moment, live each moment as if it were our last moments. The good that you would do, do now. The love that you would give, give now. Commit what you would make, make it now. For as John Ruskin once put it, that every dawn of morning be to you as the beginning of life, and every setting sun be to you as it close. Then every one of the, these sort of lives live is sure record of some kindly thing you've done for others, some goodly strength or knowledge you gained for yourself. Be patient, be faithful, be prepared.